This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a drama, romance, sci-fi film called Perfect Sense. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. As the sun begins to rise in Glasgow, Michael wakes up the woman lying beside him and asks her if she wants to go home. The woman said that she just fell asleep, but Michael hasn't slept at all because he has a hard time sleeping when someone is next to him. The woman gets upset that Michael is kicking her out after having fun with her all night, but she agrees to leave. Elsewhere, Susan and her sister Jenny take a walk by the seaside. When Jenny asks what Susan wants to do for the day, Susan tells her that she feels like throwing rocks at seagulls. Jenny senses that Susan is frustrated about being alone, so she assures Susan that she'll find someone to be with soon. When Susan arrives at work, her colleague, Stephen, informs her that they've been called to the hospital. Stephen surmises that Susan hasn't been going to work lately because she's sick, but Susan confesses that she's unhappy because of a man. On their way to a patient's room, a nurse warns them that the patient is furious. Then the patient's wife approaches them and tells them that her husband called her and suddenly wept while telling her that he no longer understands the meaning of life. Her husband is a truck driver who doesn't usually say such things. The woman then reveals that her husband lost his sense of smell afterward. Upon meeting the patient behind a glass window, Susan asks the man if he has seen anyone with similar symptoms at home or work, but he doesn't have a clue because he's been in the hospital for half a day. Susan reminds Stephen that she's an epidemiologist, so she has no reason to see the patient. Stephen discloses that Susan was called because similar cases appeared in Scotland and other parts of Europe in the last 24 hours. There's no indication of an infection, and there's no connection between the patients. During a busy shift at the restaurant, Michael and his fellow chef, James, chat about the girl Michael recently dated. James scolds Michael for dumping the girl after sleeping with her. James would have made breakfast for the girl, but he adds that women seem to prefer jerks over nice guys. James warns Michael that he'll be in love one day and he'll feel miserable. When Michael takes a break in the alley, he sees Susan smoking by her window, so he asks her for a cigarette and a light. After Susan throws him a cigarette and a lighter, Michael introduces himself and shares that he works at the restaurant nearby. Susan refers to him as a sailor after Michael throws back her lighter, so Michael clarifies that he's a chef. Days passed, and the epidemiologists discover that the disease is not contagious, but they still don't know how people acquire it. Susan notes that the source could be environmental or a toxin. Stephen then notifies his colleagues that he'll tell the public that the disease will probably disappear soon to avoid panic. Soon, several people are found crying in the streets across the globe. Susan notes that people are initially overwhelmed with grief before losing their sense of smell. While Michael heads home on his bike, he encounters several people wearing face masks, even though epidemiologists have said that the disease isn't contagious. As the illness spreads, people stop going to restaurants, so Michael and the other employees have nothing to do. One night, the chefs decide to go home due to the lack of customers, but Michael stays behind for a smoke. Moments later, Susan arrives and sees Michael smoking, so she remarks that Michael seems to have his own cigarettes. Susan still refers to him as a sailor, so Michael reminds her that he's a chef. Susan then clarifies that she's just emulating her father, who calls everyone a sailor. Before Susan can enter her building, Michael invites her to eat in the kitchen. During the meal, Susan discloses that she's gluttonous when she eats because she had a disorder when she was young. Michael tries to give Susan something for dessert, but she suddenly bursts into tears as their conversation about sailors reminds her of her father. When Michael embraces Susan, she tells him not to do it because it might be contagious. Michael then takes Susan to her apartment as she continues to cry. As Michael lies with her in bed to comfort her, he becomes afflicted and starts crying. The following day, Susan and Michael find out that they've lost their sense of smell. When Michael returns to work, their boss instructs the chefs to cook their best food to compensate for the loss of their customers' olfactory senses. As people try to move on with their lives, Susan laments the loss of memories triggered by specific odors. She expresses her concern that millions of past images in people's minds are slowly disappearing due to the absence of smell. One day, Michael and Susan go for a walk. Under a bridge, they come across a street performer who encourages them to reminisce about their olfactory senses and appreciate the other senses that remain. Later, the two return to Susan's apartment and make love. Afterward, Michael tells Susan that he'd like to sleep beside her. He notes that it's unusual for him because he normally can't sleep when someone is next to him. Susan, however, stresses that she needs to be alone. 
so Michael leaves her after giving her his number and address. When Susan meets with Jenny, she reveals that her ex-boyfriend has already married. Jenny asks Susan if she's interested in being in a relationship with Michael, but Susan is hesitant because she thinks she usually picks jerks. Jenny argues that not every man is a jerk, but Susan stresses that she'll just try taking care of herself. As people continue to struggle, different groups look for someone to blame for the disease. Environmentalists believe that it's the beginning of an ecological disaster caused by pollution, while fundamentalists of various religions blame non-believers. Communist regimes contend that capitalists released a military virus to stimulate the economy. At the lab, Stephen becomes delirious and starts rambling about people plotting against him, so his colleague immediately injects him with a sedative. Later that day, Susan is suddenly overcome with the fear of dying alone as she walks to her car. Barbara, another employee at the lab, notices that Susan is disconcerted, so she tries to calm her down. At the restaurant, Michael and other chefs are also experiencing panic attacks. When Susan finally calms down, she grabs Barbara's bouquet and chews on it. Back at the restaurant, Michael and the other employees grab anything they can fit into their mouths. Soon, people all over the world are engaged in an eating frenzy, gobbling up anything in front of them, even raw meat. When the madness ends, the people realize that they've lost their sense of taste. When Michael goes home, he finds Susan waiting for him. That night, Michael asks Susan if she thinks they'll lose their remaining senses. Susan explains that taste and smell are related senses, so the others might not be affected. The next day, Michael goes back to the restaurant to find out if he still has a job. The owner tells him that he decided to close the restaurant because people can no longer smell or taste. People will just buy flour and fat because that's all they need to survive. Michael encourages his boss to keep the restaurant open because he believes the people would still want to dine out despite their missing senses. As the weeks pass, people try their best to live as if everything is normal. They look to their other sensations to cope with the loss of their sense of taste. People continue to dine in restaurants for the experience of offering dinner to someone or having someone wait on them. Instead of focusing on the taste of food, the chefs at the restaurant turn their attention to the appearance, temperature, and texture to please customers. One night, Susan asks Michael to play a game called Make Me Special. The only rule of the game is to tell the other person something no one knows about them. Susan confesses that she hates her sister's kids sometimes. She then reveals that she can't have children because her eating disorder damaged her ovaries. She admits that she only pretends that she's not interested in having kids, and she tells people that she has an interesting job to keep them from asking if she wants to have children. When Susan tells Michael that it's his turn, Michael confesses that he once had a girlfriend that he intended to marry. However, she was affected with a disease that caused her body to emit a pungent smell. Instead of taking care of her, Michael ran away. When she died, Michael made an effort to visit her grave once a week, but the visits became less frequent as time went by. Michael confesses that he went to her grave to feel guilty, but he admits that his guilt is already fading. After some time, a doctor from Thailand contacts Susan and her colleagues to report that people in the country are already losing their hearing. The doctor notes that people initially become enraged before going deaf. Not long, the doctor starts yelling at the epidemiologists and demands them to send help immediately. Riots become commonplace as the new symptoms spread all over the world. When Michael returns to work, he finds the authorities sealing the entire building because of an infected person on the third floor. An officer informs his boss that they're shutting down the restaurant, but the council wants to hire them to cook for the thousands of people under quarantine. As the authorities leave, the restaurant owner expresses his frustration that the only food they'll ever serve is fat and flour. When Susan arrives, Michael informs her that she's currently homeless because of the quarantine, so she has no choice but to stay with Michael. On the way to Michael's house, Susan stops by a corner and rolls down the window to hear the ringing of church bells and other noises. As soon as they get home, they kiss over their mask and sigh in relief that they've avoided the chaos outside. As Michael prepares a drink, Susan hugs him and expresses her bewilderment that they suddenly ended up living together. Michael notes that they could keep playing games like Make Me Special. Suddenly, Michael starts acting out against Susan and tells her that she's just like the other woman who spread their legs in front of him. He criticizes that the only thing different about Susan is her infertility. As Michael begins smashing things in the house, Susan flees and drives to the lab. A few minutes later, Michael calms down, but he starts screaming in a panic as he realizes that he has lost his hearing. He tries to leave the house, but the authorities push him back inside and seal the door. Susan soon reaches the lab, 
but she finds no one there but Stephen. Later, Michael calls Susan to apologize and tell her that he didn't mean anything he said. Michael contends that the disease caused him to say those horrible things, but Susan gets exasperated and throws away the phone. Not long, Susan starts breaking things in the lab as Michael continues to beg her to come back on the phone. By the time Susan wakes up, she can no longer hear. When she walks around the lab, she witnesses Stephen experiencing the first symptoms of hearing loss. When Michael leaves the house, there is no sign of the authorities, so he heads to the restaurant. Inside the kitchen, Michael finds his boss sleeping on the ground. Michael can't communicate with him properly, so he just invites him to smoke a cigarette outside. Susan decides to stay with Jenny instead of going back to her apartment. When Jenny writes a note asking about Michael, Susan contends that she was right that she always picks jerks. As the new symptoms become more widespread, some people stop obeying the laws because they believe it's the end of the world. However, others still report to work, hoping that life will continue. Others just keep working because they don't have anything else to do. Soon, the chefs and other workers return to the restaurant to clean up. Susan and her colleagues also go back to the lab to keep working on a cure. Some people prepare themselves in case they also lose their sight. They practice by blindfolding themselves and walking behind a blind man as their guide. Most people spend their time doing things that are important to them. Susan becomes content just watching Jenny and her kids as they spend quality time together. When Michael gets off work, he waves outside Susan's building to see if she is there. He throws a bottle at her window in frustration when no one responds. Soon, the next symptom emerges, and people wake up with a profound appreciation for life, along with a strong urge to offer warmth and love to someone. People all over the globe start embracing each other everywhere they meet. Not long, Michael cheerfully rides his bike through the streets to find Susan. Elsewhere, Susan drives in her car on the way to the same location. When Susan arrives, she checks the restaurant but finds no one there. Michael arrives a few seconds later, but he heads straight to Susan's apartment. When he gets to the window, he sees Susan getting in her car. He hurries back outside, but Susan is gone by the time he gets there. When Michael turns around to face the building, Susan's car emerges from an alley and stops. Michael eventually turns back and sees Susan getting out of the vehicle, so he walks slowly over to her. As Michael and Susan approach each other, they seem to be losing their sight gradually. Michael and Susan feel for each other's arms when they meet. By the time they embrace, their world goes dark. All they can do is kiss and feel each other's tears on their cheeks. This is all for story recap for today. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Tell us in the comments if you want us to recap your favorite movie. Watch other of our videos showing on the screen and leave a like because it helps the channel. And I would see you in the next video. Goodbye.